And now, please welcome former South Carolina State House Representative and current CNN commentator, Bakari Sellers. At least he didn't say fake news commentator. Uh, good evening. Good evening. I want to first begin by um, echoing what my mother and father always taught me to be the two most important words in the English language, which are the words thank you. Um, thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, thank you for the families of those whom we lost. Um, thank you for people like Chief Mullen. And thank you to the organizers of this event. You see, two years ago today, I would have said it couldn't happen. Two years ago today, I would have imagined tomorrow to be brighter, bolder, more hopeful, and without fear. Two years ago today, I would have been tied up in knots over mundane details. A phone call not returned, a late appointment, traffic, absolutely oblivious that somewhere the clock was ticking and every moment was critical. Two years ago today, I didn't know the name Dylan Roof because two years ago today, it hadn't happened yet, not until tomorrow. But two years ago tomorrow, at right about this time, 8.16 p.m., he walked through those great doors of Mother Emanuel, and in less than an hour after sitting, talking, and praying with them, he would gun down nine men and women for no other reason and they were black, that unforgivable sin. But two years ago today, it hadn't happened yet. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to simply thank you for having me here tonight as we join together and remember those hollowed grounds. And by grounds, I don't mean the floor or earth beneath our feet, but the reason for which we have joined together our hallowed and righteous purpose to make ourselves free. And as intelligent and as original as we like to think we are, this Charleston Forum, this event, us gathering here tonight is not a unique purpose. In fact, it was 159 years ago today, a former congressman from Springfield, Illinois, stood to accept the Republican nomination for president and declared clearly for all the nation to hear that a house divided against itself cannot stand. He said, I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free, Lincoln explained. He said, I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. All one thing or all the other. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Yet here we are nearly 160 years later, nearly two years later, and we're still trying to figure out how to bring the house together. And what is the solution? I don't have the audacity to believe that in my 32 years of great wisdom that I have all the answers. Because right now, right here in South Carolina, how many black and Hispanic children are living in or near poverty? Over 300,000. How many black males born today can expect to spend time in prison during his lifetime? One in three. And what continues to be the leading cause of death for black males between the ages of 15 and 34? Homicide. Why is infant mortality more than twice as high for black children in South Carolina than white? Why is it that while African Americans are roughly a third of our total population, we are over 60% of the prison population? Why did it take nine people to bring down a flag? Why did it stop there? You see, for me, I am full of youthful exuberance and optimism, and I believe that it doesn't have to. 
It doesn't have to stop there. I dream every day of abolishing mandatory minimums and closing the school to prison pipeline and setting a new national standard in use of force that puts an end to the needless shootings and police deaths that we see. I believe that this is in our hands. I dream of lowering the cost of prescription drugs, improving Obamacare instead of repealing it, and protecting Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and the Earned Income Tax Credit. You see, I believe that that is up to us. I oftentimes ask myself, do you want to close the wealth gap and create real opportunity for our families? Do we really want to put people to work and rebuild our roads and bridges? Do we want to make sure that every child in this state, every single child in this state has a real quality education regardless of where they live or who their parents are or the color of their skin? You see, for me, I believe that it's in our hands. It's up to us. I had the privilege of being with Barack Obama on January 10th in Chicago, Illinois. It was his farewell address, and he said if we want to change, if we want to progress, if we want to change the world we live in, our political conversations can't be confined to social media message boards and those who already agree with us. We have to become apostles of hope. We have to become apostles of the truth and take that message to the streets and the storefronts, the dirt roads and poor rural communities and church cookouts that look a lot less like Cleveland Sellers and are more like Mike Pence's. You see, we have to be prepared to be uncomfortable. We have to seek it out, engage it, relate to it, and then we can change it. For me and many of us in this room, we all know the story about the cool February some 49 years ago when a young group of students gathered together much as we have gathered here today for a singular cause and a common good. And I've heard how they've raised their voices in unison, hoping to draw attention to one of the last vestiges of discrimination in Little Orangeburg, South Carolina. It was a small whites only bowling alley. The history books call it Jim Crow's final hiding place. And so they had their demonstration and as night fell and cool turned to cold, they built bonfires and they sang protest hymns. And they were filled with faith without fear because they felt safe in their numbers and their communion because they couldn't have imagined what would happen next. And they couldn't imagine that the state police who'd positioned themselves along the embankment in front of their beloved campus and down Highway 601 would close ranks like they did. They didn't foresee that those shotguns would be loaded with deadly double-eyed buckshots and would be turned on them with deadly intent. They couldn't have guessed that for the next eight seconds their faith would be pushed to fracture and their lives would change forever. Only eight seconds to turn the fires crackle to the snap and zip of gunfire, the sparkling embers that were doting the night's air turned to murderous lead ripping into their backs and their buttocks and the bottom of their feet as they ran for their lives. The night of hope and change turned to desperation and despair. The faith of freedom songs turned to screams. You see, I already know that story about the Orangeburg Massacre, and I imagine most of you do too. But see, that's not enough. Right now, there is some teenage boy out there reading some online rant from Breibart or the Council of Conservative Citizens, and you see, he needs to hear that story as well. He needs to understand it in the worst way, because if he doesn't, he may become another Dylan Roof. He needs to hear it. His parents need to hear it. His friends need to hear it. Everyone in his neighborhood needs to hear it. And then we need to sit down and hear their stories, too. We have to begin to listen to one another because that is what a democracy is, and that's how we get better, one by one, with each other as a people. You see, no one ever promised that it would be easy, and no one ever said that there would not be a fight. I promised Amanda Loveday and a few others that I would not dare preach. But I will tell you that God didn't promise us that no weapon would be formed against us. He promised us that it wouldn't prosper. And the challenge for everyone in this room is to rededicate ourselves to the proposition of loving our neighbors even when they don't love us. You see, that is what America is. It's a nation of citizens beholden to each other, though disjointed and dissimilar, engaged in this great and constant conversation. This experiment of self-government to build the land promised in Micah where everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree and no one will make them afraid. And no one will make them afraid because the future cannot be found in fear. You see, fear is what keeps us in our silos. 
It's what keeps us fighting petty skirmishes, ignoring the war for tomorrow. And we can no longer afford to be afraid because we are the solution that we've been looking for. We are more than the sum of your parts and more than a voter ID. We are change if we want to be. But I guess all of you all have to channel your inner 32-year-old from the big city of Denmark, South Carolina, because you too have to believe it. You have to believe it like I believe in you. And together we will build a nation that is no longer divided upon itself. We'll find a future optimistic and hopeful. We'll make a day where this can never happen again. And looking back across the tides of history from all those years to come, we will point and say here at this moment, on this hollowed ground, this is where it all started. And once we started, we never look back. Thank you and God bless you all.